Thank you for the invitation. I would probably speak for about 45-50 minutes, then we'll have some discussion. Uh, the October Revolution, of course, was in many ways uh, a unique event in world history. I think it was unique in at least two ways. Firstly, you had had revolutions before. Uh, you had had revolutions against oppression, resistance against oppression, but these had been basically uh, in specific contexts, in, within a country, within a particular area, within a particular region, they had been really specific revolts against oppression. The October Revolution saw itself as part of a world revolution. In fact, very self-consciously, it saw the October Revolution as the harbinger of a world revolution. It did so not because it was in some sense, uh, it consisted of people who were kind of more revolutionary or more, more kind of you know, determined to, to make humanity come together, but it did so because I think capitalism had actually brought the world together to a degree where a revolution like the October Revolution had to be a world revolution. In fact, it was a part of the theory underlying the October Revolution that it had to be a world revolution. So the idea of the liberation of humanity as a whole being on the historic agenda was placed for the first time by the October Revolution. The second way in which it was unique is that it was not just a spontaneous rising, it was actually in many ways theorized, planned. It was part of a very conscious praxis. So much so that many people have seen the October Revolution as a kind of Blanquist uprising, you know, like, like, like Blanqui used to have these uprisings, you know, made several attempts at revolution in France before. A kind of putsch or a coup d'etat. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the idea of looking at the October Revolution in this manner arises from the fact that it was not like the French Revolution when the Bastille was stormed, nobody planned the storming of the Bastille, or even the February Revolution in Russia that preceded October. Uh, it was not really just one of those spontaneous uprisings. Of course there was an uprising, but that uprising culminated in a revolution as part of a planned praxis. Now these are ways in which for the first time you had a very different kind of revolution compared to anything that had preceded uh, this particular event. Uh, I think much of the discussion of the October Revolution of course centers around the question of what are its historical legacies. What did it achieve and so on? That's basically what most people have been concerned about. I'll deal with it very briefly. I think, of course, when we are talking about the historical legacy of October, we are really thinking of the historical legacy also of the Soviet Union, which was set up by the October Revolution. And in that, there is no doubt that it had an impact on the entire 20th century down to this day which is quite phenomenal. There are at least three different ways in which it made a decisive difference to the 20th century. One, as was mentioned by the chairperson, was the defeat of fascism. I think one of the biggest achievements of the October Revolution was the setting up the Soviet state that actually played the key role in defeating fascism. Some people may say that, look, what's the connection between the Soviet Union and the defeat of fascism? I think if you compare the experience of France, which completely went under when the fascist onslaught happened, with that of the Soviet Union, which resisted it, you get an idea of the kind of popular support for the Soviet state, for the resistance to fascism that was aroused in the Soviet Union, that did not exist even in France, which had had a revolutionary tradition of its own. So there is no doubt, of course, that Stalingrad was the turning point of the Second World War. And of course, but for the Soviet Union, we would be sitting under the so-called Reich for a thousand years. The second major 
factor that was kind of, you know, uh, started by the October Revolution is the phenomenon of decolonization. I think decolonization of the Third World was really possible but for the Soviet Union. And this is something which not only is clear from the fact that someone like Winston Churchill didn't even want to give independence to India, it is true that at that particular conjuncture, after the end of the Second World War, imperialism was on the back foot. It was, it was not really on the ascendancy, but on the contrary, it was in retreat. But on the other hand, if they had weathered that moment, then it's quite possible that actually the whole phenomenon of decolonization is something that would not have happened at all. But I think the Soviet Union was responsible not just for the political decolonization, but more importantly for the economic decolonization that followed. As a matter of fact, nominal political independence is not enough. What really is required is for the people of the third world to gain access to their own resources, uh, to their own economies, which in a sense imperialism had actually broken. And this is where the Soviet Union played a phenomenal role. This is true of India, where I don't know if you, many of you may be aware of this, that in India, for instance, uh, this, the oil majors, those days, seven big oil companies, which were called Seven Sisters, used to rip off India. As a matter of fact, the amount of money they used to import oil from the Gulf, refine it in India, and practice transfer pricing, because they were the ones who imported the crude, they were the ones who refined. <coughs> so by jacking up the crude prices, which was really a book transaction for them, they ripped off India, where roughly about 10% of the entire export earnings of the country in the 1950s were simply taken away by the Seven Sisters. So when the Soviet Union offered to sell crude to India at prices much lower than what the Seven Sisters were charging, they refused to refine the Soviet crude, at which point then refineries were set up in the public sector with Soviet assistance and the Soviet Union also uh, helped in prospecting and, and developing whatever oil resources we had. Now that's just in the case of India, but in country after country you can see that the capturing of control over your own resources by the newly liberated third world states was made possible because of the Soviet Union. <coughs> I mean, when, when Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal, there was actually an Anglo-French invasion. And of course, the Soviet Union gave an ultimatum, and, we, and, and that invasion was actually withdrawn, which led to Mr. Anthony Eden's government in Britain collapsing. So, the, you, you, Cuba would not have survived all these years, but for the assistance from the Soviet Union. And what is more, even the, we know that the Vietnam War would not have been won without the assistance of the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union played a phenomenal role in the whole decolonization, both political and economic, of the Third World. And of course, as far as the Soviet Union's own economy and so on are concerned, for the first time, we set up an economy which was completely different from anything that humanity had known until that point. We know, for instance, that capitalism is characterized by unemployment, but for the first time you had an economy where not only did you not have unemployment, you actually had labor shortage. And of course, at the same time, it set up the most gigantic welfare state system, as far as the working people are concerned, anywhere in the world. Later on, we talk about the National Health Service that Anurin Bevan had set up in Britain. Much of it was modeled on the Soviet Union itself. So, so the point is that it set up a society which in many ways was something the like of which had never really appeared. At the same time, of course, it had very deep flaws. And, and I think when we are looking back at the October Revolution, it would be absurd not to look at those flaws because after all, the Soviet Union has collapsed. And I think one of the biggest flaws, uh, you know, by flaw I mean maybe it was historically conditioned. That's that's a debate I don't want to get into. But but one of the biggest issues that we have to recognize is the fact that you had the dictatorship of the proletariat, which was the nature of the Soviet state that was set up after the revolution. 
uh, transforming itself or becoming transformed into basically the dictatorship of a party. Uh, if you have a dictatorship of the party, then it does two things. One thing it does is that it depoliticizes the proletariat. And I think it is worth thinking for all of us why when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was not <coughs> one single working class strike. Now that's, that's, that's a very major phenomenon. This was unthinkable earlier. As a matter of fact, uh, many of you will know that in Germany there was a man called Kapp in, in 1925 who tried to attempt a right-wing push and that push was defeated because of a spontaneous working class strike. The working class had been so active in defending socialism, is in beating back right-wing offensives against uh, the socialist movements, let alone a socialist state, that the fact that it did not come to defend the Soviet Union through a general strike at the time it, it collapsed is suggestive of the kind of depoliticization of the workers that had taken place. But depoliticization of the working class also had a dialectical uh, kind of, you know, opposite, namely the depoliticization of the party itself. Because if the working class is depoliticized, the party too uh, also gets depoliticized. And, and it is not very surprising that when you look at the collapse of the Soviet Union, all the people who became the presidents of the republics into which the Soviet Union disintegrated, uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Ukraine and so on, all of them had been members of the Politburo of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Whether you look at Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, Edward Shevardnadze, Ismail Karimov, uh, Leonid Kravchuk, um, Boris Yeltsin, all of them, after all, constituted the leadership of the CPSU. As a result, you had a situation where obviously the, the Politburo of the CPSU that existed prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union obviously did not believe in socialism because none of them went on to head the various republics into which the Soviet Union got fractured, really carried out any socialist program of any kind. As a matter of fact, as somebody pointed out, in the whole of Eastern Europe, the, including the Soviet Union, the only socialist leader who continued to affirm his faith in socialism was Eric Honecker of the GDR. Uh, but uh, other than that, and all the others, in fact, you know, started lecturing in Harvard and so on after the collapse of their respective states. So depoliticization of the working class as its dialectical counterpart, depoliticization of the party was a major factor behind the collapse of the Soviet Union. But the point is nonetheless when we recognize that, we recognize it to ensure that future revolutionary attempts must avoid such depoliticization when we recognize it, we must also recognize the enormous contributions, the historical contributions of the Soviet Union and of the October Revolution that set up the Soviet Union. But today what I really propose to talk about is not so much the historical legacy of the Soviet Union or of the October Revolution, uh, but I must tell you a story, a joke. You know, when I was a student, uh, Nixon had gone to um, China and to the Soviet Union for, you know, that 1973 Nixon went, you know, that, that uh, you know, kind of shook uh, uh, Mao Zedong's hand, uh, at which point Joan Robinson, Professor Cambridge, told her Chinese kind of hosts that President, uh, Chairman Mao shook a hand dripping with blood because the Vietnam War was going on at that time. Uh, but, you know, when, when, when Nixon went to the Soviet Union, he attended Bolshoi Valley in Moscow and somebody shouted out, assassin. And so we, who are students of the we said that who says this, that people are depoliticized in the Soviet Union? There are still people who really are so kind of strongly committed to the, to the left that they actually shout out, even though the Soviet state is trying to build normal relations with 
with Nixon, they shouted assassin. But it turned out that the, that the woman, the girl who shouted assassin, was an Italian tourist. <laughs> but anyway, that's the kind of situation. But, but as I said today, what I propose to talk about really is the theoretical legacy of the Soviet Union, uh, of, of the October Revolution. And I think that theoretical legacy is something that remains with us. In, in, in other words, that is uh, absolutely uh, crucial even for us. I think what the October Revolution did is that it really revolutionized the concept of revolution. Now that in a sense all revolutions do. I mean, no revolution is a replica of something that happened before and consequently every revolution in some sense revolutionizes the very concept of revolution. But the October Revolution did so in a decisive manner, so decisive that as I said that any revolution that happens even now or in the years to come is something that cannot but be influenced by the theory of revolution that was put forward in October. Uh, there were two decisive steps in, 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 in this conceptual uh, uh, re reconfiguring of the concept of revolution. Uh, first, of course, is that when Marx and Engels was talking about, they were talking about the revolution, they basically had in mind a proletarian revolution in Europe. Now Marx, as you know, and Engels in his letters to Kautsky and so on, uh, talked about revolutions in India, revolutions in Egypt and so on, they visualized it and, and, and they welcomed it. In fact, Engels actually says to Kautsky that the revolution is likely to happen in India. Alas, it has not happened. But he, he says that a revolution is likely to happen in India and that would be very good for us, meaning that would be very good for the European proletarian revolution. They recognize the possibility of revolutions in third world countries, but on the other hand, what exactly these revolutions would be like, what their relationship with socialism would be, not in Europe, but socialism in those, own, those countries themselves was something which was never really clarified by them and I don't even think they thought much about it. Uh, while the October Revolution was based on a theory that proceeded as follows, that said that the bourgeoisie which comes late to uh, <coughs> the historical scene, in other words countries where you have a late bourgeois development, the bourgeoisie is not in a position to carry out the anti-feudal, the democratic anti-feudal revolution to its completion, like it had done in France in 1789. It's not able to do so because of the fact that it fears that any attack on feudal property would might rebound into an attack on bourgeois property. As a result, the bourgeoisie makes common cause with the old feudal lords broadly and therefore carrying forward the democratic revolution is something which is now the job of the proletariat. And the proletariat can do so by having a worker-peasant alliance which then carries forward the democratic revolution. And a worker-peasant alliance led by the proletariat that carries forward the democratic revolution is not then going to stop and hand over, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of historical possibilities back to capitalist development. It would actually carry forward the democratic revolution towards socialism. In the process, of course, the nature of the worker-peasant alliance, the exact class configuration of the worker-peasant alliance would change. But on the other hand, the idea therefore was a continuous revolution in which the leadership of the proletariat arouses a worker peasant or leads a worker peasant alliance to complete the democratic revolution and to lead on to socialism. In which case, socialism is no longer a matter that is of concern to the Europeans, but socialism is a matter that is of concern to every country, including even the third world country, because that's precisely where the bourgeoisie has come late on the scene. Therefore, the concept of a socialist revolution is not one which is confined only to countries with developed proletariat, advanced capitalist countries, 
but this is a concept which now is relevant for all countries, it's relevant for mankind as a whole. And it also meant, so, so first it generalized the notion of revolution and the idea of socialism being on the agenda. Secondly, it also recognized the crucial role of the peasantry. Now, I mentioned that Marx and Engels had in mind basically the idea of a proletarian revolution in Europe, but the only attempt at a proletarian revolution that happened in Europe was the Paris Commune. And the Paris Commune was defeated because the French president of the time, Thiers, got the help of the peasantry behind the bourgeoisie by using the argument that an attack on bourgeois property would rebound into an attack on petty property. That peasants, if you go with the communards, in that case today they may be attacking capitalism, tomorrow they'll be attacking your property as well. And consequently, the idea of making a split between the work, and, and, and the peasantry was persuaded by this because the peasantry in France had been a beneficiary from the 1789 revolution when feudal estates were broken up and these estates were divided up among the peasantry. So where you had this thoroughgoing bourgeois uh, revolution, you actually had a situation where the defeat of the proletariat could be assured by the bourgeoisie by enlisting the support of the peasantry. But precisely the opposite would happen in countries where the bourgeoisie is not in a position to, to kind of smash uh, feudal land, landlordism, not in a smash to, uh, not in a position to smash the old feudalism, because there the proletariat can actually enlist the support of the peasantry to carry forward the democratic revolution to start with, and then of course to move on to socialism. So the idea of socialism being of relevance to mankind as a whole, not just to advanced countries or to Europe, is something which for the first time was put forward by the October Revolution, and of course the theoretical work on this had been done earlier, Lenin in particular, to tactics of social democracy, etc. Uh, the second break that actually is of great importance is the fact that with imperialism now, you had the proposition that this movement towards socialism, which is now on the agenda of every country, is has now become imminent. In other words, it's not just in a historical agenda in the distant future, but it is now imminent. Now is the time that actually such a thing can be done. You know Lenin's theory of imperialism where he said that basically centralization of capital had given rise to the formation of something called finance capital, which is a coalescence of banking and industrial capital under the control of financial oligarchies in different advanced countries. And these oligarchies who are fighting amongst themselves for economic territory across the globe, in a globe that is already partitioned, this fight can only take the form of attempts at repartitioning an already partitioned globe and that can only be done through war. And therefore, the argument was that wars are now going to be a feature of this era of imperialism. What does the war do? The war gives the working class in all the belligerent countries a choice between killing fellow workers across the trenches or turning your guns against the system that makes you kill fellow workers across the trenches. The war also brings in people from colonial and ex-colonial, uh, sorry, colonial and semi-colonial countries uh, as cannon fodder. As you know, many people from India had gone to fight in the First World War, including the revolutionary poet Kazi Nazrul Islam. And when you, when it does so, it not only, it not only uh, kind of gives them military training. But additionally, it enlarges their consciousness, their knowledge of the world, and what is more, it also makes them aware of the fact that the choice before them is to kill others, fellow colonials, or, 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 or workers of other countries across the trenches, or to turn your guns against your imperialist masters. Therefore, in a sense, that not only was it the case that 
that, that, that through Worker Peasant Alliance now moving towards socialism had become something which every country had to basically, uh, uh, you know, had as part of its, 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 its future, but this future is something which was now, now the time to reach towards this future. So imminence of uh, such a movement, and that's what this was, uh, you know, theorized by Lenin in his theory of the weakest link, and the communist international that was set up at that time was something which was such a unique phenomenon, the like of which the world had never seen, because you had had the first international, the second international, but the communist international was one, the third international was one in which you had the British, the Germans, the French communist leaders hobnobbing with the Chinese, the Indians, the Vietnamese, the Mexicans. Nothing like this had ever appeared. Nothing like this had ever happened. That was not what you had in the first or the second internationals. So, so obviously, in, in, in that sense, this theoretical break, and this theoretical break about the imminence of a world revolution in which all the entire humanity is involved, is something which was not, as I said, based on wishful thinking, or simply a desire for, for, for a good thing to happen, but it was actually based on a very rigorous theoretical analysis. That theory, which was developed even prior to the Bolshevik Revolution, was carried forward and the whole communist international was based on that particular theory. Now, I think it is very clear that the world we live in today is very different from the world that that theory was talking about. In my view, that theory was absolutely right for that conjuncture. You have the First World War. Imagine the period from 1914 to 1945. You have the First World War. You have the Great Depression, which again, in one sense, is because of disunity among the different advanced capitalist countries. You have the rise of fascism. You have the uh, Second World War. In other words, a conjuncture where Rosa Luxemburg's words, in Rosa Luxemburg's words, mankind's choice was between barbarism and socialism, appeared to be absolutely true. And it is that conjuncture where, as I said, the imminence of a world revolution was something which, 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 which was not only really accepted by many, but inspired many, many, many. It inspired people uh, from the villages in India. So, so, so the point is that this was uh, very, I mean, it, it inspired because it was true. What you have had in the post-Second World War period, in my view, is a change in the conjuncture. Now, I know that this is not often recognized, but on the other hand, I believe it's very important to recognize it. Now, this change in the conjuncture has occurred, uh, and, and I want to discuss it in some ways, because my topic is October Revolution and the present. We cannot understand the present without understanding the change in the conjuncture that had happened. That had happened. The first significant change, of course, is that inter-imperialist rivalry leading to wars, which was so important a part of Lenin's thinking, is now no longer as important. Inter-imperialist rivalries are muted. In fact, you would not find a single... There have been wars. Wars are going on. There have been terrible wars in the, in, in the Middle East and so on. But, but you would not find a single war in the post-Second World War period, which was either between any of the two or three major capitalist powers, or in which major capitalist powers, even by proxy, were arrayed on different sides of the combatants. So you don't have a situation now where inter-imperialist rivalry is anywhere as strong and acute. Contradictions exist. But rivalries leading to war, which was the reading of the Communist International, is something which have got, which have disappeared, rivalries have got muted. In the beginning, this happened because following the Second World War, the United States emerged as the single largest power. 
So in the south, not just in the north. There are other factors behind this, but, but, but essentially, therefore, what globalization does is that it unleashes the process of primitive accumulation of capital, and what is more, it also gives rise to a fragmentation of society that you actually now have a whole lot of casual workers. You know that casual workers are, workers are very difficult to organize into trade unions. Uh, I mean, you know, they can be very easily dismissed and so on. And as a result, uh, you, 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 you have a fragmented, an attempt at a fragmentation of the society. Uh, and therefore, there's a political weakening of the left that takes place everywhere. Okay. The fact that the left all over the world has been weakened is not just because of subjective factors that you don't have leaders like Lenin and so on, but also because I think the era of globalization, precisely when you, you would expect that actually the left should be getting stronger, it actually gets weaker. Why should we expect it should be getting stronger? Because there's a period in which, precisely for the reasons I'm talking about, you have an enormous increase in inequality because obviously the working people as a whole are stuck where they are but on the other hand labor productivity rises therefore surplus rises therefore the capitalists and the fingers on get a larger proportion of GDP than, than the kind of you know working population and therefore wealth inequalities also start increasing etc. In this period as you know there's been a phenomenal increase in inequality which people like Piketty and others have been talking about. But this increase in inequality is not because of the causes that Piketty and others have been talking about. It's precisely a reflection of the kind of capitalism, neoliberal capitalism, under which we are currently living. But neoliberal capitalism not only brings this, and what is more in India, there are reasons to, you know, one can even argue that actually absolute poverty has increased in its incidence. But not only does neoliberal capitalism bring all this, namely uh, a muting of inter-imperialist rivalry, it brings uh, a desegmentation of the world, it brings a kind of fragmentation of the working people, it brings growing impoverishment and certainly much uh, enlarged inequalities and so on, and a general weakening of the left, because as you know Marx had said that one of the things about capitalism is that it creates its own grave diggers by bringing the workers under a factory and therefore forging an instrument that can actually overthrow capitalism itself. But we must recognize that under neoliberal capitalism, the effort in some sense is in the opposite direction. Not to have a, a, a proletariat under one factory, or even if you have a proletariat under one factory, to ensure that they're all casual workers who can be thrown out at the drop of a hat. Uh, but one implication of all this is also that neoliberal capitalism is enmeshed in a crisis. The crisis which began in 2008 continues and notwithstanding all talk about revival, recovery and so on, it is going to continue. The crisis is caused precisely because of the fact that, as I said, desegmentation of the world economy has given rise to an increase in the share of surplus in world output because the working population has had its absolute living standards fixed. Labor productivity has increased, so surplus has increased. The increase in surplus implies a shift of income distribution for the working people to the surplus earners, and since the surplus earners have at the margin much lower levels of much lower kind of consumption income ratios compared to the working people, this implies a general uh, weakening of demand, a general tendency towards overproduction. This general tendency towards overproduction in this kind of a regime can be negated through the formation of some credit bubbles or asset price bubbles, but credit bubbles won't last forever. After a while, you are not going to give more credit to somebody who's already indebted. And asset price bubbles tend to collapse, as we know, the kind of collapse that has actually brought about this crisis after 2008. No new bubble is on the horizon, and even if some new bubble came to revive the world economy briefly, with its collapse once more, there'll be a crisis. So we are now stuck in a period of protracted and fairly deep crisis. 
This protracted and deep crisis has also given rise everywhere to a tendency towards fascism. Fascism, as you know, arises in periods of crisis. This is what had happened in Germany, Japan, and so on. The Great Depression had produced fascism. Not surprisingly, the current crisis, too, is producing fascism. Nowhere do we have a fascist state. But fascists are in positions of power in several countries, in my view, including in India, uh, though, of course, they would like to push it towards a fascist state, but they have not succeeded in doing so. Nowhere in the world do we actually have a fascist state, but on the other hand, whether they succeed in pushing the existing bourgeois states towards fascist state or not depends upon the kind of resistance that can be put up. Now, it is in this situation that I believe that once more, the kind of thing which Rosa Luxemburg had said that mankind's choice is between barbarism and socialism is again becoming a relevant phenomenon. Politically, there is the danger of fascism. Economically, there is this whole business. The entire world is now caught in the midst of a crisis involving substantial unemployment and acute distress. Even in the pre-crisis period, for reasons I, I, I've been talking about, there was a growth in inequality, poverty and so on, all of which has actually become even worse in the period of crisis over the last decade or so. Now, it is therefore once more, we have we once more, you see, so, so if, I mean, okay, this is, in my view, a new revolutionary conjuncture is opening up which is not the same as the conjuncture of the October Revolution, but which is also very different from the conjuncture of post-war capitalism. In other words, neoliberal capitalism has again brought us to a situation where without overcoming neoliberal capitalism, we cannot get out of the crisis. And of course, overcoming neoliberal capitalism would be a step in the transition towards socialism. Now, it seems to me that therefore, before the left there are enormous historic opportunities both to defend people's democratic rights at the level of the political plane and also to get people out of this economic crisis that they are caught up in. Many believe that, and, and this is the last point I want to make, many believe that the fascist movements which have come up now all over the world are somehow going to get people, get the world economy out of this crisis. As a matter of fact, in the 1930s, fascism had got the depression-affected economies of Japan, Germany, and so on, out of the crisis through militarization, through rearmament, and so on. Many people believe that a similar thing might happen today, where through militarization and rearmament, the world may once more come out of this crisis. But on the other hand, that I believe is not true. And that is why contemporary fascism has an Achilles heel, which has to be, which, which, which therefore makes the prospects before the left that much more kind of, you know, uh, I mean, you know, that, that, that the revolutionary <coughs> prospects that much brighter. What is the Achilles heel of contemporary capitalism? Like a contemporary fascism. Maybe contemporary fascism is also caught within this globalized financial flows. Globalized finance does not want either government expenditure financed by larger borrowing or government expenditure financed by larger taxes of capitalists, both of which can produce some kind of a revival of the economy. And consequently, the kind of agenda which can give rise to a revival of the capitalist economies, even through militarization, is something which is foreclosed by the hegemony of international finance capital. And that being the case, contemporary fascism is also hamstrung. And consequently, the crisis that we see today is not going to be overcome even by fascism. This crisis is going to persist, this crisis is going to deepen, and of course, at the political level, the crisis would be sought to be managed through repression, through fascist repression, both of which, therefore, you know, once more, as it were, revive Rosa Luxemburg's 
reading of the conjunction and therefore place before the left uh, the, 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 the prospects of an advance on behalf of mankind as a whole, provided the left, of course, itself rids itself of the hegemony of neoliberalism. I think over large parts of the world, the left too is hegemonized, in my view, by the neoliberal ideology. Once you rid yourself of that hegemony, you can actually live up to your historic role. Let me stop there. Thank you.